Good morning, everybody, on this Tuesday, the 19th of September 2003. I uh, hope you've come down from some rugby and cricket fever over the past few days. Um, on behalf of the Paper Manufacturers Association of South Africa and the Sustainable Forest Assurance Scheme, we, inv we, are, we welcome you to the second webinar on carbon measurement and reporting for forestry and forest products. This webinar is, uh, follows the introductory presentations that we did on carbon reporting and carbon tax in July, and um, this, this discussion will give us a little bit more uh, detail on se sequestration guidelines, the metho methodology and some mo monitoring, the monitoring reporting and verification tool that is used to calculate carbon se sequestered and the greenhouse gas emissions. My name is Samantha Charles and I'm your host this morning, along with Jocelyn Lydell. Jocelyn is an independent verifier for the forestry sector. She's also a chemical engineer with more than 15 years experience in sustainability and her focus over the years has been on assisting clients to identify, fund and implement resource efficiency projects in the areas of energy, water, waste and greenhouse gas emissions. She also has a focus on post-consumer waste management, uh, also known as recycling, and um, has been involved in the development of a number of waste management plans for the public and private sector. So without further ado, I hand over to Jocelyn. Great, thanks, Samantha. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone. Lovely to be here with you today. Um, today, we're going to be talking predominantly around the MRV tool um, for the calculation of greenhouse gas emissions um, in the forestry sector. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and we're going to basically run through elements of the tool and the calculations and how they work. And what I will do is I will pause um, in, in the presentation at some points to take questions. So uh, I will pause and allow um, some points and some time for questions as well. Um, before we kick off, just to uh, just to note, um, yeah, like Samantha mentioned, obviously um, I have been involved in the calculation of greenhouse gas emissions for a number of years. Uh, but I'm not a forestry expert, so I'm glad to see that there are some people in the audience who definitely know the different types of trees. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think uh, jointly we'll be able to answer any questions that come up. Uh, my expertise sits really on the calculation of greenhouse gas emissions. Great. Um, so with that said, let uh, me share my screen and then we can kick off. Thanks. Great. So today we'll be focusing on calculating carbon sequestration using the MRV tool that has been developed by the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment, DEFI in this case. I'm really going to talk about the introduction, which covers some important points that you'll need to know going into the rest of the presentation. I'm then going to talk to the principles of greenhouse gas emissions accounting. Again, this serves as some background that you'll need to know when we get to the actual calculations. We're then going to talk about forestry activities or specifically the plantation, um, the sources and sinks of carbon in the plantation and how you quantify those in line with the MRV tool and the associated guideline. We're then going to talk through the mill activities and the harvested wood products. And then at the end, we will take question and answers. However, I will stop at uh, various points throughout this presentation to take questions and answers um, as well, uh, just to give you the opportunity to ask when the item arises. Great. Um, the objective of the webinar today is really to help you understand the principles of greenhouse gas emission accounting in the forestry sector, uh, the calculations for greenhouse gas emissions associated with plantations and harvested wood products, and ultimately is to allow you post this webinar to be able to on your own use the MRV tool, the measurement reporting and verification tool that has been developed by DEFI. In order to allow you to be able to do this post the webinar, what I will be doing is we will be doing a worked example and we will be referring to the MRV tool. 
What I'd like to do just briefly before we continue is to just really cover some of the basics. Now, I know quite a few of you on this call are probably familiar with it, but just bear, in, uh, bear with me for the next kind of two, three minutes where we cover some of the basics, just to ensure that everyone is on the same page before we launch into the MRV tool and sequestration. Uh, for everyone's benefit, there are six categories of greenhouse gas emissions. You'll see these six categories represented in this picture on the side. Um, the most common is obviously carbon dioxide. However, we will also be dealing with methane and nitrous oxide um, in the MRV tool. So you will see these three gases come up um, in the MRV tool and in the discussion today. Uh, you won't see the second uh, three categories three um, gases come up. Um, and then, yeah, basically we are going to be dealing with carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide. Great. Um, essentially what we are doing here is a carbon balance. And so that's also something to bear in mind here. Essentially what we are doing is a carbon balance. So we will be looking at a carbon gas balance for the plantation. And then secondly, in terms of determining the carbon in the harvested wood product, we will be doing a carbon mass balance for the mill. In this case, it's sawmills, paper mills, board plants, etc. Ultimately, the second part here, the intention is to calculate the carbon that is stored in the harvested wood product. So the carbon that is stored in the products that are made by the sawmills, the paper mills and the board plants. Um, this is a diagram that you'll be familiar with. It comes out of the guidance associated with the MRV tool um, and basically speaks to the different aspects of the calculation in terms of where carbon is released or stored. Uh, just in terms of what we spoke about earlier with the carbon mass balance, you will see that there is um, carbon stored in the plantations that we will be taking a look at as our first step. And then as our second step, we'll be looking at the carbon stored in product and how you calculate that um, in terms of the MRV tool. Um, before we go any further, just important to know where all the documents saved. Again, many of you may already know this, um, but important now if you can stop and make sure that you are uh, familiar where important documents are saved. Obviously, the most important documents are the sequestration guideline and then the Excel version of this tool, the MRV tool for carbon sequestration. Um, so you will be able to find both of those on the SAGES, um, the South African Greenhouse Gas Emission Reporting System. You'll be able to find that on the SAGES landing page. Um, so you can navigate there now and just make sure that you are able to download the guideline and then also the tool. Um, I will be working through the guideline uh, or certain parts of the guideline in the presentation today. Um, and I will be obviously navigating at some points to this tool so that we can do some worked examples together so that by the time you leave this webinar, hopefully you will be able to apply the relevant calculations and to complete the tool um, to be able to calculate the emissions, um, both the sinks um, or the emissions absorbed and the emissions released in the plantation and obviously the carbon stored in the harvested wood product. Another important document or important series of documents is the IPCC 2006 guidelines. Again, you can navigate to the IPCC 2006 guidelines using the link provided in this um, slide. Um, what you will see is you will see on the landing page that there are a number of different volumes. The volume that we are focused on today is volume four. Um, and from volume four, you will see that there are two, really two important chapters. Um, one of the most important is the generic methodologies applicable to multiple land use categories. So that is chapter two of volume four. And that is really the basis of the guideline, um, the, the sequestration guideline developed by DEFI. The other one that is important is forest land. So that takes these generic methodologies and applies or provides some specific information related to forest la land in, in terms of being able to, to apply the tool. 
Um, so these are also important documents that you can refer back to. The principles of our greenhouse gas reporting are based on the 2000, the IPCC 2006 guidelines. Great. Um, before we get into cal calculating or using the MRV tool, probably important just to discuss some of the principles. Now, most of these principles associated with greenhouse gas emissions accounting, you'll all be familiar with, or they just are common sense. Um, there are a lot of principles. I'm not going to speak about them all in detail. I just have basically highlighted in lighter blue the ones that are important or the ones that uh, I will elaborate on a little bit more. Um, but the first principle is relevance. I'm not going to spend too much time on relevance. Um, the second principle is completeness. Completeness is obviously important because you need to account for all the sources and sinks of greenhouse gas emissions. And so it's important to make sure the calculation is complete, that all emissions sources and emission sinks, where sinks are basically the absorption or um, the um, removal of, of greenhouse gases, that that is accounted for. Um, so you need to make sure the inventory is complete. Consistency is another principle. Um, this speaks to consistency and how you, um, in the time periods you use for your reporting, as well as in the methodology you use for your reporting. Again, I'm not going to spend too much time on these principles, but you will be able to see them in the guideline, as well as in the IPCC 2006 guidelines. Um, comparability, also another important one. Um, that follows on from consistency. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Um, another key one is accuracy. Obviously, we aim to be as accurate as possible in terms of our quantification of the greenhouse gas sources or emissions and sinks. Um, and this is important because there are different levels of accuracy, and we will touch on this briefly later on in this webinar. Transparency. Transparency is always important, and it is, I guess, the um, one of the main principles associated with greenhouse gas emissions accounting. And so it is important that you are reporting transparently and also that you are providing evidence um, and evidence for what you have done um, so that there is some verification that can take place. Being transparent in any of the calculations you've used and any of the data you've used, activity data and emission factors is key. It allows DEFI as well as any other third parties who review your greenhouse gas emissions inventory to make sure that they are comfortable with it. Um, significance. Significance is also important. This speaks to materiality. I'm not going to talk too much about materiality and the considerations in terms of materiality today. Um, but obviously important to note that there are certain um, significance or materiality thresholds uh, that can be applied in terms of understanding what needs to be disclosed and what doesn't need to be disclosed. Um, one of the other important principles is that we adhere to the IPCC guidance. And so where I spoke about using the IPCC 2006 guidelines, that is the basis or the backbone of our greenhouse gas emissions reporting. Uh, it is what we use when we report internationally our own carbon inventory as South Africa, and all companies who report on their greenhouse gas emissions are required to adhere to the IPCC 2006 guidance or guidelines. Um, therefore, adherence to the IPCC is critical, and that's why in the previous slide, I would have pointed out that when, uh, that an important source will be the IPCC 2006 guidelines. Um, obviously, the MRV tool and the guideline available from DEFI is based on the IPCC 2006 guidelines. So you may be able to use those without referring back to the IPCC guidelines. But if you are ever confused or need more information on any of the elements contained in uh, DEFI's MRV tool or in DEFI's guideline, you can refer back to the IPCC guidelines. Great, let's talk briefly through some of the other principles um, of greenhouse gas emissions, re um, emissions reporting or accounting. 
So eligibility, I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Again, you can read up on that in the uh, MRV or in the carbon sequestration guidelines from DEFI. Permanence, permanence is quite important. It's about making sure that uh, what you are disclosing remains um, permanent. So in other words, any sequestration that takes place remains permanent. Um, accounting periods and intervals, again, not going to spend too much time on this, but this is basically regarding the time periods for which you report. Um, in the case of our national reporting and our sequestration, including our carbon tax, the reporting is over calendar year. So all the reporting we done we do runs from January to December each year, and so your accounting periods should align with the calendar year. Robustness, again, uh, I guess pretty much common sense. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Additionality, also not going to spend too much time on it. We can discuss it at the end if we do have time. Incentives and policy alignment is another guideline. Um, or another, another principle, again, not going to spend too much time on it. Um, leakage is important. Um, a lot of you will be familiar with the wording, but if you aren't familiar with what leakage is, um, leakage pertains to um, leakage pertains to emissions that occur outside of the boundary as a result of an initiative that you have implemented. Um, so one of the principles of greenhouse gas emission accounting is that you make sure where there is any sort of leakage that that is taken into account. If there are emissions that result outside of the boundary for which you are accounting um, your emissions, it's important to consider that. However, we do need to make sure that leakage doesn't take place. And like I said, if it does account for it. So leakage is something that occurs, out, emissions that occur outside of your boundary as a result of the project or initiative that you have implemented. Um, probably the key point or the most important here is the double accounting. And you'll see as we go through this presentation, a lot of the provisions or a lot of the information um, provided uh, is, is to avoid double accounting. So it is important that there is not double accounting of emissions. Um, and this, this becomes quite important when we talk about um, emissions in the plantation and emissions in harvested wood products, especially if the mills are purchasing in any product or any uh, what they call raw material like pulp, for example, or recycled fiber where those um, the emissions associated or the carbon stored in that harvested wood product is already accounted for by a third party. There can be no double accounting. And so throughout the guideline developed by DEFI, um, there are various um, elements which speak to ensuring a double accounting does not occur. So that, for example, you are not accounting for emissions or claiming carbon stored um, where someone else is claiming the same carbon stored as well. Um, before we move off the introduction to start to uh, get into the MRV tool itself, uh, just important to know that there is a distinction between reporting and accounting, and this distinction is made by DEFI in the MRV tool. Reporting, reporting is the reporting you do on your emissions for the purposes of reporting to DEFI under the National Greenhouse Gas Emission Reporting Regulations, or the NGERS. Um, so this is for reporting on your emissions to DEFI, and it includes all reportable sources and sinks of greenhouse gas emissions. And obviously, these reportable sources and sinks are further defined in the um, National Greenhouse Gas Reporting Regulations, each of the different IPCC codes are given a threshold, and if you exceed that threshold, then you are required to report on those emissions for the purposes of reporting to DEFI. Accounting is slightly different. Accounting is for the carbon tax. So under the carbon tax, you are allowed to claim for the carbon sequestered in your plantations, um, and in harvested wood product, the carbon sequestration in this case is what we call accounting. There are some slight, there's slightly different rules with regards to accounting or slightly different uh, sources included and excluded when it comes to accounting or rather excluded. Um, and so accounting is for the purposes of carbon tax and it excludes some of the reportable sources of greenhouse gas emissions. 
So please bear in mind there's this distinction between reporting and accounting. However, you will see that in the MRV tool, it will become apparent as we use the tool. You'll see here a snapshot um, of the output of the tools where it talks about reporting and accounting. And you'll see it'll calculate automatically once you put in the relevant information, the reported value, and that is the value that is reported to DEFI, and the accounted value, and that is the value that is applicable to the sequestration that you can claim under the Carbon Tax Act. Emissions that are reported but not accounted, in other words, you report to DEFI, but you don't account for them in terms of the sequestration under the Carbon Tax Act are emissions associated with fires, emissions associated with fertilizer application, emissions associated or carbon sequestered in recycled inflows. And we will speak to these different elements a little bit later. And then obviously emissions associated with solid waste, liquid waste and um, emissions or emissions to air atmosphere at the mills. So biogenic emissions to the atmosphere at the mills. These are all reported to DEFI if you exceed the threshold. But from a sequestration perspective, they are discounted. Again, we will talk to these shortly, so don't be overwhelmed at this stage by the terminology. We will go through the MRV tool and the different sources so that by the end of this presentation, you can apply the MRV tool yourselves. Um, one of the things to bear in mind here is that the guideline from DEFI refers to third party and it refers to boundaries um, and so the boundaries are an important issue that we will discuss throughout this presentation um, but from a carbon tax perspective the sequestration you claim has to be under your operational control um, and that becomes important because you can't necessarily you can't be claiming for uh, emissions or carbon sequestered in third party plantations at this stage Obviously, that is something that PAMSA has been working on um, over the last uh, last couple of months to years, and they will then be providing an update at this stage. However, um, from a national treasury perspective and from a carbon tax perspective, you have to be claiming what is under your operational control from a sequestration perspective. Again, we will touch on this as we walk as we move through the presentation. Um, one of the other principles or one of the other aspects of greenhouse gas emissions accounting that it's important to be familiar with, because you will hear this terminology both um, in the tool, but also in the guidelines and in the IPCC 2006 guidelines, you will see, you will hear reference to tier one, tier two and tier three. Um, what we will be doing today is focusing on tier one and tier two. Uh, tier one is basically where we apply all the equations that are in the MRV tool and we use the emission factors in the tool. These emission factors are default emission factors and they would basically be emission factors that are extracted from the IPCC 2006 guidelines. Um, there is an element of tier two also built into the tool. Tier two uses the same equations in the MRV tool but it does apply some, there are some emission factors that you can apply that are specific to your own facility under a tier two. Um, so we will be touching on tier one and tier two. Tier three is where you use your own facility specific equations and those equations may sit outside of the MRV tool. And so today we will not be discussing tier three. Um, if you are planning on applying the tool for the first time, you will most likely be using tier one in any event. So by focusing on this, you should have enough knowledge to apply the tools. As you become more mature in your reporting, you can move towards a tier three method where you use basically your own specific equations to determine the greenhouse gas emissions uh, sequestered um, in your plantations and stored in the harvested wood product but that would come at a later stage as you move uh, or become more mature in your reporting. At this stage, most companies are reporting on tier one or a combination of tier one and tier two. Great, um, I'm going to maybe pause there just to see if there's any questions on the introduction sections before we move on to the specific calculations. If anybody does have any questions, you're welcome to raise your hand and I'll allow your, your microphone 
um, so that you can give your question to Jocelyn. No hands shooting up, yet. nothing yet. Oh, okay, great, okay. perfect. Great, hopefully everything is then relatively clear before we move on to um, the next part of the presentation. Oh, we have a question, sorry, Joss. Uh, sure. There's a question no from, from John. Hold on, John, let me just give you your microphone. John, you should be able to unmute yourself and speak. We'll have to, you'll just have to unmute yourself on your side. Doesn't seem to. Okay, got it. Oh, there we go. Oh, sorry, awesome. it was hiding. It was hiding somewhere else. Um, when you talk about operational control, I, if you're managing uh, a, a third party's plantation, you've got a lease agreement, for example, is that operational control? Um, so I guess strictly operational is control is defined as having the uh, authority to implement your own operating policies and procedures within the activity. So yes, if you are following your own operating policies and procedures and you are the ones that are then conducting the activities, um, you should then be eligible for it under operational control. Um, so operational control doesn't necessarily mean the same as ownership. It means, do you have the authority, full authority to implement your own operating policies and procedures within that activity? And so I guess, are you the ones carrying out those activities? And potentially in your case, although I guess it would require some further discussion and investigation, it is possible that you would have operational control if you were managing the plantation, applying the fertilizer, doing the harvesting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, even if you did not own that plantation, it could be under your operational control. Yeah, thanks. I think that, that answers it. Um, very, very briefly, a lot of forestry companies will lease land and apply all their specific operational tools to, to that land. Yeah, and um, I think... And then obviously you can use the timber from that land and then use it for accounting purposes. That where I think it's not within your control would be a private company that you purchase the timber from and that is not under your operational control. I think that clarifies it. Thank you. Great. Yeah. And uh, I think, um, you know, obviously, obviously the definitions are a little bit ambiguous, um, but ultimately the, you know, the real concern um, at the time from National Treasury was where you didn't know what was happening um, at the plantation and you were trying to claim for what was happening at the plantation. Whereas if you are managing it and it is under your operational control as defined, then you do know what's happening. You know how much fertilizer is applied. You know how much uh, wood product is being harvested or how much is harvested. You know whether you're doing slash and burn, et cetera, et cetera. So in that case, it could be argued um, or the argument exists that it is under your operational control. Um, yeah, and so so worth considering. Okay. Yeah, I think, I think this is what PAMSA, sorry, I don't want to go on about this, but I think this is what yes. PAMSA is looking at through uh, certification programs to be able to do that uh, in the future. Thank you for that. Great, yes. I, I think there has been quite a lot of work that PAMSA is doing on third parties and the inclusion of that, because obviously we don't, we want to encourage that there is purchasing happening from third parties um, and that you can still claim for that. So that is work that's ongoing by PAMSA as well to get to get Treasury to allow um, third parties, um, even, for example, if you are not necessarily the manager thereof. Um, but yeah, I think the next webinar will focus specifically on that. Cool, good question. Um, great, anything else before we car you. carry on? I don't see any other hands. Joss, you can carry on. Great, perfect. Okay. You need to unmute okay. me. Sorry, was that a question? No, I think no, no. Carry on. Okay, cool. Okay, great. Um, okay, cool. Um, so let's let's focus specifically on the forestry side. In other words, what's happening in the plantation? Um, so this is basically giving you a high level overview of the different, I guess, sources and sinks um, in terms of carbon in a plantation. Um, so obviously you would have uh, carbon that is being taken up out of the atmosphere and stored in the trees as the trees grow. Um, there is storage both above ground, um, so obviously um, above ground in terms of the, 
uh, trunks and the leaves, et cetera, et cetera. And there is storage that happens below ground as well. So in the roots and the soil. Um, and that's why they talk about below biomass growth below and well above and below ground. So that is really where the carbon is taken up. It's taken up as your trees grow. Um, and then it is released through a number of different um, avenues, the obvious one being fire. So when there are any fires that occur in the plantation, whether that is wildfires or fires that you do to put in, for example, fire breaks or burning um, of the slash or the residue post harvest, there is carbon released when there is a fire. Um, not only is there carbon released, but there are there is also methane and nitrous oxide released. So you will remember in the introduction, we spoke about those six categories of greenhouse gas emissions and the fact that we would be focusing on three of those. So when you have a fire, you're releasing carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide. Um, there is also carbon that is released as uh, as basically what is left on the ground post harvest. Uh, or what falls off the trees um, basically starts to decompose. There is obviously a release there of carbon. And then as the trees grow, an uptake of carbon. Um, in terms of where the emissions come from, there are, or where the carbon is lost rather from the plantation, carbon is lost as wood is harvested. So as you cut down the tree and you remove it from the plantation, that is a loss um, in terms of uh, what we will be calculating and considering in the MRV tool. There is also losses from fuel wood removal. Um, some, in some cases, there may be um, some, some biomass or some wood that is removed and used as fuel wood, in which case that is also a loss. And then there are losses from disturbances. So if, for example, there's a fire or if there is damage from insects or, or the like, um, there would be losses that occur in terms of carbon lost from the plantation. And so really what the focus of the first part of the MRV tool is or the guidance is to be able to allow you to calculate firstly how much carbon are your trees absorbing as they grow. That's both above and below ground carbon. And then how much carbon is released or lost as a result of various aspects that occur in the plantation. Um, and so that is really um, what the tool is aiming to do. Um, and these are the calculations that have been set up and we will work through them and work through a kind of a high level example to give you a feel for how the tool works and the calculations work. But what we're aiming to do is to calculate how much is absorbed as your trees grow and then how much is released from or, or how much is, let, let, is lost from the plantation as various activities occur. Um, obviously, this is quite high level. There are various other elements that need to be considered, but we will, like I say, be just touching on, on the basics here to allow you to be able to use the tool yourself at the end of this webinar. And then obviously, if there are specifics relevant to your own plantation or your own operations, we can discuss that or engage further at a later stage. Okay, so how do we calculate the carbon um, that is uh, stored or the carbon that is taken up in the trees and then the carbon that is released? And so that's where these calculations come in that I'm going to be talking through shortly. One thing to note is that this is an annual calculation. Like I mentioned earlier, you're calculating it from January to December in line with a calendar year each year. So we're not looking at the total carbon that is stored in the trees. We're looking at the difference in carbon that is stored at the end of the year versus the beginning of the year. So really, we're interested in the growth. We're not interested in how much is already stored, sto um, how much is already stored in the plantation. We're looking at the changes, the uptake that happens or the release that happens um, in a year, in a calendar year. And so that's important to note when we are doing the calculations. We're not trying to calculate the total that is stored. We're trying to calculate the change. There are two methods that are used, and you'll be able to see these two methods when we do the worked example in the tool. Um, there are two methods that are used to calculate this change um, in, in carbon that occurs in the plantations over the period of a calendar year. Um, they are called the gain-loss method and the stock difference method. 
You will see more information about these methods, both in the guidance and the IPCC 2006 guidelines. Um, but ultimately, the gain loss method just looks at the, the difference in emissions. So it estimates the gains and losses. The stock difference method looks at what is your stock, so what is your total stock, your total tree at the beginning of the year, and then your total tree at the end of the year. So it takes the difference in stocks between the beginning and the end of the year to calculate the difference. So it takes the stock at the end of the year minus the stock at the beginning of the year, and what remains is the difference, and that is what uh, the changes are in the plantation carbon stocks over that year. Uh, you will see briefly the calculations from these two different methods um, so that you can elect which method to use. Um, let's focus um, again, let's talk briefly about these two methods before we go into a bit more detail. So like I said, the gain loss method is looking at the differences, so how much is gained in the year minus how much is lost in the year, so it looks at the differences. Um, whereas the stock difference method looks at the stock at the end of the year minus the stock at the beginning of the year. Ultimately, they in reality will give you the difference um, or the change that occurs over the period of that year. They just follow slightly different methods in order to get you that difference. Um, so ultimately, we're, we are trying to quantify the annual change in carbon stocks in the biomass. And uh, that would be the difference between the gains and the losses or the difference between what remains at the end of the year minus what was there at the beginning of the year. Let's talk briefly about the gains loss. We have seen this calculation in the previous one. It's basically what you want to calculate, which is the annual change. And then that's the gains minus the losses. So the questions become how do you calculate the gains uh, and the losses. Uh, the gains are calculated really by looking at the area of the land that we are considering. Um, and we will talk to that shortly, but it's the area in hectares multiplied by the growth that happens over that year. So the growth that happens in your trees over that year um, multiplied by the carbon fraction. So this is basically how much carbon is in that growth. So when your trees grow, um, they absorb carbon, and this carbon factor is saying, okay, um, how much how much carbon is there in that biomass that has uh, grown over the year? So this is the again, this is the gains that we're looking at here, and it's the area multiplied by how much biomass growth you've had in the year multiplied by how much carbon is in that biomass growth. Um, so the question becomes, how do we determine that biomass growth? Um, the carbon fraction is quite easy. It is basically at this stage a default. Remember, we are using some defaults because we're using tier one and tier two. And so this is a given factor and you'll see this factor in the MRV tool. So you don't need to worry about this carbon fraction. That is a default value. Um, you don't need, and then the area, the area is something you should know um, as the um, as having information for the plantation and we'll talk about how you divide the areas up because it's important that these areas are distinct are divided by um, the type of tree species because there will be um, some uh, and compartment ages there will be some differences in these various default values depending on the tree species etc cetera, etc cetera. so we will go into that but in principle you need to know the area that you're looking at you need to know how much growth has happened in that area, and then this is a default value. Now, this growth is calculated. So again, the tool gives you various calculations to be able to determine this growth, which is great because if you are not a forestry expert, um, there it becomes quite challenging to be able to determine or accurately quantify this growth. So there are methods that we can use in order to do that. So let's look at the growth. Um, so the growth is basically um, calculated by how much growth has happened above ground um, and then you would adjust that or increase it by a factor that takes into account the below ground. So like I said, there's obviously carbon that's stored above ground and below ground um, and so you would calculate how much is stored above ground and then you would use a default value to adjust that to take into account based on how much is stored above ground, how much additional you would have below ground. Um, again, you will see this in the tool. We will shortly do a bit of a worked example. Um, so you will see this in the tool. So the question, uh, so the question is basically, do you know the above ground biomass growth? 
if you don't, then it is possible to calculate this uh, annual biomass growth in a different way. Um, and this is the calculation that we see most commonly used. Um, so what this calculation does is you'll see it's still making the adjustment for the below ground. So it's still making this adjustment using a default value for the below ground, but it is now allowing you to calculate how much you how much biomass growth you have in a specific year by looking at what they call the average net annual increment. Um, and so that is basically how much growth you have um, in the plantation um, or in the specific compartment that you're looking at over the period of a year. Again, we will um, basically go into this now with a bit of a worked example. So it may seem a little bit confusing at this stage, um, but, but we will go into it. Um, so let's maybe take a look here to see if we can, let's try an example together before we stop um, and talk about some of the losses. So now what we're doing is we're calculating the gains. We're calculating the gains based on the area, based on this carbon fraction. And then what we are going to do is we're going to calculate um, this uh, G total, which is the um, annual biomass growth by looking at how much is adjusting for below ground. So adding the below ground and then looking at the above ground. For the above ground, I'm going to be using um, a, a kind of net average increment. So this is how much it's going to grow by or how much it grew by um, in the year. So let's just have a look. I'm going to share my screen and we're going to use the MRV tool. Great. Um, so this is the MRV tool. It may look overwhelming at first, but once we've gone through this webinar, you'll be able to see quite easily how it's used. Um, I will navigate between the different tabs, but let's let's basically um, just uh, look at a couple of things. The first one is that um, you will see that there are a whole lot of parameters. Um, like, for example, we spoke about that R value in the presentation, that R value that adjusts or helps you to incorporate um, how much uh, carbon there is or how much biomass there is below ground. Um, and you'll see that there are R values that are really built into the calculator. So you'll be able to see R values for different uh, tree species that you can use um, as uh, in order to calculate uh, the carbon that is sequestered. Um, so here are a whole bunch of R values. You just need to know which tree species you're dealing with and you can then apply the correct R value in this case. Um, there are also other parameters which we will touch on. So basically, when you're using the tool, you'll see all of the default values you need are built into the tab that is labeled parameters. Uh, you will also see BCEF lookups. So these are biomass expansion factors. Um, and so they look at um, basically allowing you to convert your meters cubed in your in terms of your growth into tons of dry matter. Um, so you'll see here there's a BCEFI, which will allow you um, to calculate or convert your meters cubed of growth into tons of dry matter. And again, there these are default values based on your tree species as well as the climatic zone, as well as the growing stock level. You then will be able to, if you know those values for your plantation or know those parameters for your plantation, be able to select the correct value. Um, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna do a brief example of loss gain method. Um, and so um, just in terms of a brief example, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use uh, this uh, this line row 23 here so that you can see what I'm doing. Um, and what we'll do is we'll use the parameters in this presentation. Okay. So let's say, for example, um, we know that the, again, this asks you to enter some basic information. So I'm not going to talk about afforestation and deforestation today. I'm going to assume that the majority will be forest management, which means that it's a, a plantation or an area that where the trees have been growing there for 20 years. Um, so you're not deforesting, you're not removing the trees and you're not afforesting, but we will 
uh, we can talk about that at a later stage and questions if we need to. But for now, I'm focusing on forest management, which is the majority, to keep it simple. Um, and then we will just enter a species. Let's say, for example, we're dealing with pines here. Um, and you can then also enter an age category. Um, what I'm going to do is put the parameters in here. So you will see we're following these formulas. We are putting in the area, which is the value A. Area is 100 hectares. Carbon fraction. Now, this carbon fraction is a default from the parameters table. In this case, we're going to be using 0.47. Um, and you'll see where this default comes from. It's the parameters table, and you'll see it's 0 0.47. I've assumed that this um, average or this incremental growth is sitting at 12 meters cubed per hectare per year. And so you will see that I'll put in the, the growing stock volume as 12 for the purpose of this. Um, and then we have this fraction to convert um, for uh, the carbon to biomass growth. And you will be able to see here, sorry, you'll be able to see here that this is the BCEFI. And I'm going to just, in this case, put in a value of um, 1.5 for the purpose of this calculation. Um, this is then a calculated value. So you'll be able to see that it's calculated and that is giving you your living biomass gain. And so basically by filling in um, a few small parameters. So we filled in basically um, these parameters. We've been able to calculate um, what the biomass gain is. So you've been able to basically calculate delta CG, which is your biomass gain, your annual increase in carbon stock due to biomass growth. You've been able to calculate that by putting in a few simple parameters into the tool. Now, obviously, selecting the defaults is important, so you need to make sure you select the right ones. Having the right area is important. The area needs to be subdivided in such a way that these defaults are applicable, and so you need to take into account what these defaults are dependent on in order to subdivide appropriately and to put in the correct area. And then what becomes um, important is obviously coming up with this value in terms of how much biomass growth you have per hectare per year, and there are various models um, that you can use um, to do this. I'm not going to focus on all of those different models here. They're very um, plantation forestry specific, but there are various models that can be used to determine how much biomass growth you are getting in a specific year. Um, now that we have tried an example, you'll be able to see that there are a number of different lines where you can obviously um, put in your different um, areas of your plantation or compartments of your plantation into the appropriate values, and it's going to then calculate your living biomass gain, which is what we've seen here. Okay, so let's go back to the presentation, um, and let's just talk briefly about the um, losses. Um, so now that we've done the gains, we need to understand the losses. Um, in this case, the losses are um, as a result of wood removal. There are other losses which we will calculate, for example, um, the losses as a result of fires, um, and there are other losses su such as disturbances, which we'll briefly touch on. But for now, um, in terms of the MRV tool and in terms of the guideline, um, your losses are calculated as how much wood is removed from the plantation. And so this is basically trying to calculate the losses that are a result from your harvests. So how much wood you harvest and leaves your plantation, because all the wood you harvest that leaves the plantation is a loss in carbon stock to the plantation. And then it's also looking at how much fuel wood is removed. We're not going to pay too much attention to this fuel wood part um, as it's not necessarily prevalent across all plantations, but you can obviously or you do need to remove any timber that is removed and used as fuel. You do need to adjust or remove that. So how does the calculation work? We're calculating basically the annual decrease in carbon stocks due to biomass loss. Um, it's based on um, how much wood you remove. So this is your harvested wood. Um, a correction factor is then applied to convert the harvests that you remove into a tons of dry matter. Um, so into tons of biomass, basically. An adjustment is then made to uh, take into account the above and below ground. You'll be familiar with that R term. 
And then obviously also to uh, take into account the carbon fraction of that biomass or that harvest that is removed. So this part of the calculation is basically getting you to the carbon removed as a result of the harvest. Um, and like I said, we will do another worked example of this, but uh, ultimately how much wood are you harvesting? You should know that from your plantation. This BCEFR, this is a value that comes from the default. So you can use a default value for this based on the tree species growing stock levels uh, or biomass levels, and then also climatic zone. Um, and then this is also a default. This is the adjustment for below ground biomass. And then the CF, this carbon fraction here, um, is basically, like we said, also a default where it gives you the amount of carbon that is in the biomass. Um, so let's try an example again together, just so you get familiar with using the tool. Again, you can also try this on your side while I am trying it on my side. You should be able to pick up the tool from that, um, that uh, link that I provided earlier on in the presentation. Um, so let's look here. So it's on the same gain loss method tab. And now we are moving along. Now that we've calculated the gain, we want to calculate the loss. And so you'll see it'll ask you for the harvest volume. Let's say, for example, we harvested 200 meters cubed per year. We are going to put in 200 here. And then it's going to um, ask you for the factor for conversion of carbon in biomass loss. Again, this is something that can come from your um, from the parameters or default parameters and BCF lookups. So in this case, we're going to use a value here of, um, of two. Um, and then if there's any fuel wood removed, you need to add this here. In this case, we're going to assume that no fuel wood is removed, um, in which case the um, this tool will give you no as an output because there is no, um, oh, there's no fuel wood removed and sorry, there's no afforestation or deforestation. So we're just going to ignore this for now. Um, afforestation and deforestation makes it a little bit more complicated. So we will cover it at a later stage or in a separate webinar. Um, and then ultimately this will calculate your living biomass loss. So it automatically calculates your loss um, that occurs as a result of your harvests and your removal of the um, basically the trees as a result of harvesting them for use. Um, once you've got your loss and your gain, you can then apply this equation where you take your gains, which we calculated earlier on, minus your losses, and that will give you the difference, which is the value we were ultimately looking for. Again, you don't need to do this. This is automatically done in the tool. So it will automatically calculate your, your um, living biomass or the change in, in biomass or the change in carbon as a result of your change in biomass over um, the calendar year that you are looking at. So this is your delta C B as per this calculation. Okay. Um, great. So let's, before we pause for any comments or questions on this, what I want to do is just briefly talk about um, the stock difference method. Um, so we've done the gain loss method at a high level at this stage. The stock difference method is, um, I guess, relatively similar. Just remember that you are calculating this in two time periods. So you are calculating it at the beginning of the calendar year and then at the end of the calendar year, and you are taking the carbon stock on the land at the end of the calendar year and minusing the carbon stock on the land at the beginning of the calendar year to get your, ultimately, to get your delta C uh, B, which is basically uh, this one here. To ultimately get your delta C B, you are taking what's at the end of the year in terms of total carbon stocks, not just your change, your total minus what is at the beginning of the calendar year in order to ultimately get to um, your delta C B. Um, and so what you'll see here is a calculation that is given by the IPCC 2006 guidelines, also in DEFI's guideline, as well as built into the MRV tool where you would quantify at different time periods the area of the land, which we spoke about already, um, and then the volume of biomass on the land, which they call merchantable growing stock volume. Um, then there is basically, again, this default value, which allows you um, to convert that um, merchantable growing stock volume or that volume of biomass on your land to uh, tons of biomass. 
um, then you are adjusting for what sits below ground so that you have above and below ground included in your biomass. And then you are having a look at how much carbon is in the biomass, this factor we've seen before, which tells you how much carbon is in the biomass. And this is a default value. So ultimately, very similar um, in terms of how it is done um, or the parameters that we're seeing here. Um, just slightly different because you're calculating the total carbon stock of the of the land at the beginning of the year and the end of the year, and then the difference between the two will obviously be the change over that year. Um, just one other thing I want to mention um, before we take questions on this section is that you will see um, that there are also um, other areas where plantations emit. So if I go back to the slide here, you'll see that there are changes happening obviously above and below ground in the trees themselves, um, in the soil. Uh, there is also changes happening to deadwood litter. Um, so obviously when um, there are um, when some of the leaves fall to the ground or when you harvest, there becomes some residue that sits on this land and there are changes or carbon releases um, as a result of um, uh, yeah, changes in deadwood or decomposition of deadwood and litter. So um, there is mention throughout the tool and throughout the guidelines of what they call deadwood and uh, what they call litter. Um, and obviously also soils, because these are also carbon uh, sources or sinks. Uh, so deadwood and litter are together referred to as dead organic ma matter, or DOM. Um, so litter is the surface layer on the forest floor, and deadwood is all non-living woody biomass not contained in the litter. Together they're referred to dead or as dead organic matter. Um, now, we don't spend too much time on dead organic matter because the reality is that under a tier one method, um, it is assumed and in the uh, it is assumed that there's no change in the dead organic matter. It's assumed that the carbon transfer rate into the dead organic matter as well as the transfer rate out of the dead organic matter match. So there is no change. The one cancels the other out and there is no change over the year in terms of the carbon in the dead organic matter. And so ultimately, when we do a tier one calculation, um, we tend to ignore dead organic matter because we assume that there is no change. However, this is not necessarily the case in afforestation and deforestation activities, so it becomes more complex. But uh, just because of time constraints, we're going to not focus on afforestation and deforestation. We're going to assume that the plantation is mature and you're doing forest management. In which case, dead organic matter or changes in dead organic matter are assumed to be zero. Um, um, the same is true of changes in carbon in the soil. So we refer to it as soil organic carbon or SOC. Um, and there is soil organic carbon in organic and mineral soils. And there are changes that occur. However, the assumption at a tier one level is that there are no changes. And we only estimate changes in the case of afforestation and deforestation, which we're not going to be focusing on today. And so um, just bear in mind that you will see these terms. You will see soil organic carbon or SOC and you'll see dead organic matter. Um, but we are not going to um, be, be necessarily um, assuming that there are any changes as a result of that. Um, again, you'll be able to see here um, when we when we refer to dead organic matter, there is ability to put in values if there has been changes in dead organic matter. But ultimately, we tend to assume it's zero that there's zero changes in dead organic matter, and so delta C is ultimately um, zero. And you'll see it comes up as zero and comes up as no if we select forest management, which we did. At the beginning here, we selected forest management as opposed to afforestation or deforestation. So there is no change in this case in dead organic matter. The same is true of soils. You'll see there's no change in the soils because we've selected zero. Um, ultimately, um, delta C is given uh, by the tool in terms of gains and losses at the end of the day. So that's ultimately the loss gain method. Um, and you will be able to see here again um, just all the parameters that we've referred to are built into this. So provided you're entering the correct values, the tool will ultimately calculate your delta CB, which is what we were looking for at the very beginning, uh, which is your uh, change in 
uh, annual change in carbon stock in biomass uh, for the plantation itself. Um, so I'm going to pause here and just uh, take any questions if there are any questions on the plantation. I know it was a very quick overview, but hopefully you start to be familiar um, with the terminology and with some of the values. Um, but ultimately, a lot of them are defaults that are built into the tool or can be accessed from the tool, provided you know various aspects of your plantation. Um, and then the ones that need to be known are obviously how much you harvest as well as your growth. Uh, we spoke about your growing stock volume, um, so how much you, how much growth there is, um, the area, the growth, and then obviously, like we spoke about, the harvested wood volume. Those is what you need to know for your own plantations. The rest are largely defaults. So let's pause here and just take any questions if there are any questions. Hopefully, I haven't overwhelmed everyone or, yeah, or, or lost everyone at this stage. Um, sorry, I had to leave the call for a few seconds because my connection died. Um, I don't see any raised hands. If anybody does any questions or comments, um, ah, we have one, Norman Lamini, and uh, there's a few others. So let me just uh, allow Norman to use his mic and then you can do so. Okay, Norman, you just need to unmute and then Julian will come to you. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Jocelyn. I'm I'm a bit uh, uh, getting worried. I, I think maybe Jocelyn, if you can talk more about the assumptions that are being made in these calculations here, because of two things that jump into my mind. The first one is on on the R factor to calculate the biomass underground. It, it looks like the, 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 the factors that, that determine that is mainly the species that is, that is, that is in, the, in the compartment. And yet I, I tend to think that the, the soil type has a lot to do with that. Uh, whatever grows underground, you may have the same species, but depending on the soil type, the amount of growth that is going to happen underground uh, differs quite a lot. I didn't see that there was some uh, recalculation or adjustment made for the soil types. So that was the first thing I am noting. The second one I, I see also on when you when we look when we looking or calculating the the biomass be below ground on the losses. It, it seems like or my my understanding was that it looks like or the assumption here is that the entire biomass below ground is removed instantly at harvesting. And that is not likely going to be the case. Uh, it, it doesn't just vanish at harvesting, but the formula seems to be saying that. Thank you. If you can just uh, work on the assumptions first, then maybe I'll, I'll attend to those two things. Thanks. Great. Yeah, thanks, Norman. I think uh, maybe just to respond to that before we take the next question, if that's OK, Sam. Um, so I think you're completely correct. These calculations make and you'll see that throughout the tool. They make a lot of assumptions. Remember, we're using tier one, tier two. Um, and so really, there are a lot of assumptions made in terms of how the biomass or how the carbon moves through a plantation. So you're correct. There's a number of different factors which would affect growth, both above and below um, ground. There's a number of uh, factors that would affect all of what I'm going to talk about now. So there are um, so so the application of the default values by no means mean by no means uh, means that we're 100% accurate. Um, so you're correct in what you're saying is the R factor doesn't take into account uh, soil type or doesn't take into account the uh, constituents of the soil or whether you have microbes in there or whether you have fungi or whether you have, you know, so so again, it's just a default value um, that's been developed by the IPCC or by various entities that have studied these things to come up with a value that is spe specific or specified by tree species. Um, and, and there will be a number of things that affect that value. So I guess we're not saying that these default values 
are 100% correct, but they give you a way of calculating it at this point without having to go ahead and do various measurements. However, that being said, if you wanted to be more accurate, if you thought, for example, the carbon being stored was far more um, than what is being calculated or what is given by the default values, you can, under a tier three method, do your own testing and come up with your own values. Uh, but you're correct. There's a hundred of hundred different um, limitations or assumptions that have been made uh, in order to be able to come up with a simple approach to calculating something that is very, very complex and very diverse and very different across uh, different plantations, different soil types, different climatic regions, different tree species, different management practices. Uh, but, but ultimately, ultimately, um, yeah, at this stage, we, we're dealing really with, with defaults that are provided by the IPCC 2006 or by DEFI um, that have been based on various studies that have been done, but by no means are 100% accurate. I know that's not a great answer to your question, but uh, you are 100% correct that these values um, are, are uh, there's a number of assumptions made in them, and I'm not going to go through all of the assumptions just given the time taken, but, you know, happy to to discuss those afterwards. But ultimately, um, yeah, you're going to see that there's, there's various assumptions here that will um, probably end up underestimating some of the carbon that's sequestered, end up being conservative. Um, but uh, like, for example, you said full biomass, you know, it does assume when you harvest that you are removing all that biomass from the site, um, which, again, um, may not necessarily be the case. Um, but these assumptions have been made to find a simple way of calculating something that is very, very complex. But you are allowed under a tier three method to to adjust those based on the reality um, for your own plantations. Not a great answer to your question, but ultimately just the way it is, I suppose, Norman. I'm not sure if that does answer your question. Cool. Um, but yes, hundreds of assumptions, and you're going to see far more, and you're going to, uh, and far more questions are going to be raised in your head around some of these values and some of the calculations. Um, but, but like I said, a simple way to try and quantify something that's complex. Um, but you can make it more complex and more accurate as you move from a tier one to a tier two to a tier three. Cool. Uh, Julian. Hi, Jocelyn. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I was just wondering for clarity's sake uh, regarding the uh, total gains. I just wanted to understand what's the difference between average annual above ground uh, above ground biomass growth and then the average net annual increment for a specific vegetation type. Where's the difference between those two uh, points? Yeah, um, I guess ultimately, um, in a way, they are almost one and the same thing, Julian. Um, so the one is really looking at a kind of average biomass growth in meters cubed per hectare per year. That's your average increment. So the increment is looking at your meters cubed per hectare per year um, across that, that compartment or that plantation or however you are um, subdividing, um, whereas the other is basically a quantification of the total. So if we go back to this presentation, um, uh, you'll see here that, uh, or even the tool, uh, you'll see here that when we talk about the increments, we're looking basically at the change, uh, the meters cubed, the average meters cubed growth that happens per hectare per year. Um, whereas the stock difference method, and you'll see this basically here, is looking at the total stock on your land. And that is basically not necessarily looking per year. It's ultimately looking at your total stock, which is then calculated uh, probably here, yeah, is your merchantable volume in meters cubed um, per hectare and then multiplied by the area. Um, where is it here? Uh, so very similar in reality in terms of the parameters they require um, but ultimately the one is calculating total stock whereas the other is calculating your average increment um, from a from a forestry perspective it just really depends on or from a plantation perspective it just really depends on what information you have available as to what you are able to use yeah 
Um, so most companies would uh, would basically base which one they used, either the stock difference or the gains and loss method, they would base it on what information they had available. So did they have, for example, what we're looking for here, did they have the um, increment or do they have the total stock on their land? Um, I don't know if that properly answers your question. If not, then um, yeah, we can circle back to it a little bit later and um, get some other people um, to also provide some input there. But I guess largely the two calculations are quite similar. The one just is looking at the change um, and trying to use a factor to calculate that change, whereas the other is obviously um, looking at the total stock on the land. Um, sorry, that, John, that did you want to come in there? Yeah. Thanks. Don't know if John wants to ask a question or, or, or kind of uh, help me out there. If he, let, you know, me, let me enable his <laughs> mic. Great. Go, go, go for it, John. John, you unmute. You are. You need to unmute on your side. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, I certainly don't want to add to it. I just want clarity okay. on why why there are two methods that you can use. Do you end up with the same figure at the end? Because if not. Um, which figure do you use for your carbon tax? <laughs> um, so ultimately, uh, it's a good question, John. Ultimately, you should end up with the same figures, irrespective of which approach you use. Um, and you would select an approach based on the information you have available. Uh, I'm not a forestry expert, but all of the information that I use would come from uh, some sort of system like, for example, a microforest. And so we would either be accessing their growth models where it's the net average annual increments, where it's that uh, gains loss method, or they would give us the total carbon or the total stock on the land. So um, ultimately, ultimately, you can select the method and you would select the method based on the information that you have available um, and which assumptions you wanted to make. And both essentially should ultimately come out with the same. Um, but again, it depends on how you go about um, how you what source of information you use. Uh, so and how accurate that source is. But yes, ultimately, they should come out. The short answer is they should come out with the same irrespective of which one you use. And the way you choose which one you use is based on what information you're able to access from your own forestry systems and what assumptions you want to make. Um, for example, if you don't have the um, if you don't have the if you don't have what we spoke about here, this um, average net annual increment, there are some defaults or assumptions you can make to use this value. And so you may want to use this rather because there are some defaults that you can use from the IPCC 2006 guidelines, depending on the climate, the zone, climatic zone in which your plantation is, the um, type of tree species, et cetera. And so you may go for this one more than you would go for um, the stock difference method, which would require that you have your merchantable growing stock volume. But ultimately, the choice is yours. And yes, the in essence, they should ultimately end up in the same. But there are some assumptions that would be made in each case, which may mean that you will end up with slight differences. No, thank you for that. That's very clear. Cool. Thank you. And both are accepted under um, DFE's reporting and for the purpose of carbon tax, both are accepted. OK. Um, I have more experience with the gains loss. Um, so most of, of my clients or most of the work I've done previously have been using gains loss and not carbon stock. But I know there are some companies that do use carbon stock um, as well. Um, and, and they feel maybe the carbon stock is more accurate because they're able to use some of, uh, they're able to more accurately quantify how much carbon is stored in their plantation at a single point in time. Um, as opposed to doing the gains loss method where they're just quantifying the differences. Cool. Thank you, um, yeah, I don't great. see any other hands raised, but thank you uh, everyone for that discussion. Um, do you want to continue? Yeah, that's with perfect. The rest? Let's continue. Um, otherwise, we will run out a little bit of time. Um, so, what I want to do now is just basically, um, now that we've touched on the forestry side of things, um, just basically talk about one or two other things. The first one is fires. So obviously, like I said, there are losses um, or there are emissions that result as a result of fire. Um, so you will see this as well in the tool. Um, and there is a formula which is used to calculate these emissions from fires. Now, remember when we're calculating emissions from fires, like I said, it's carbon 
uh, emissions, but it's called carbon dioxide plus methane plus nitrous oxide. Um, and so you will see that there are emission factors provided for carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. Um, and when we talked previously about what is report of, reportable to DEFI versus what is accountable uh, to under the carbon tax, you will be reporting on your um, on, on all of your emissions. So your CO2, CH4, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, you will be reporting on all of those to DEFI. Um, but uh, you, from an accounting perspective, you'll only be accounting for your, you won't be accounting for your emissions from fire. So if we go back to this tool here, just briefly, you'll see that you've got emissions from wildfires and controlled burnings. But like I pointed out initially, you will see that ultimately when it gets to what you report, you report on emissions from controlled burning and wildfires, but you don't account for the emissions from controlled burning and wildfires. And these emissions from controlled burning and wildfires that you report on, that is a combination of emissions that result from, and you'll see this again in the tool, it's emissions that result or CO2 emissions, carbon dioxide emissions, methane emissions, and nitrous oxide emissions. So you basically are reporting on all of those, but again, not accounting for emissions on from fires. So when you are doing the accounting for carbon tax purposes, you're not including your emissions from fires, but you are still accounting, you are still reporting them to DEFI. Uh, again, let's look briefly at this calculation. Um, the area burnt, so A is for area burnt, the mass of fuel available for combustion, and then there are default values like the combustion factor, so how much of that biomass will that, yeah, that biomass combusts, and then default emission factors. You will again be able to find the default emission factors and the combustion factors in your parameters tab. Um, so you'll be able to see your combustion factors here based on different uh, species of trees and also uh, different activities from a combustion perspective. And then you will also be able to see your emission factors. Uh, your fires also appear in this tool. So here we go, emission factors um, also appear in this tool. So you'll have your carb combustion factors um, and you will have your emission factors. Your emission factors here are given in CO2, CH4, and N2O, as we spoke about. Again, it's just a matter of putting this information into the tool when you are doing your reporting to DEFI. So it's been set up to allow you to put the information in the tool. So you would go to where it says, for example, wildfires or controlled burning. You would then be able to put in the information for the row that we are doing. Let's say, for example, the total area we are going to say is 10 hectares. We're going to put in 10. Mass of fuel available for combustion, let's say 20 tons of dry matter per hectare in this case. Um, and then uh, oh, total area, sorry, this is the total area of the plantation. Let's say it was 100. And then this is the area disturbed, which is 10 in this case. And then the type of damage, so you'd select how much damage that fire did. So let's say it was serious damage. It would then automatically select these factors. It would automatically select for you the combustion factor and the emission factors so that ultimately it would automatically calculate your emissions. And then you can check, obviously, by going back to the parameters tab, whether it has selected the right factors or selected the factors that you agree with. Ultimately, it would end up calculating your emissions from fires. So quite a simple calculation in essence, if you uh, use the tool um, in order to be able to get the emissions from fires and the tool will automatically report them um, or take the reporting value and report that at the end. So it will take the reporting value and report that at the end here. So you'll see emissions from fires, but you won't see it in the accounted value because again, we don't account for it under the carbon tax. Great, um, let's briefly, before we move on to harvested wood product, just touch on fertilizer. Again, fertilizer, um, there are emissions of um, nitrous oxide, N2O, that results 
from um, fertilizer application. If you are applying fertilizer that has nitrogen in it, um, there will be some emissions that result that you are required to report. But again, they are not um, they are not accounted for. So they are reported to DEFI, but they are not accounted for under your carbon sequestration from a carbon tax perspective. Um, so if we look here, there's a calculation which looks at how much fertilizer you applied and how much nitrogen is in that fertilizer. So you need to understand the type of fertilizer you're applying, the nitrogen content of that fertilizer, which should be available on the specs on the fertilizer. And then you need to know how much fertilizer you're applying. And then you multiply it by a default emission factor. So this is an emission factor which looks at how much nitri nitrous oxide or N2O is released from how much nitrogen you are putting on the soil. Um, again, this is all built into the tool already. So you take the tool and you would look for fertilizer. So you'd look for the right tab. You would then be able to input the fertilizer type. So let's say it's, I don't know, whatever the case may be. The forest activity is forest management, fertilizer application. Let's see if we've got an example here. Let's say we're putting a thousand kilograms uh, down. Um, and then uh, nitrogen and applied fertilizer. So you need to know how much nitrogen is in your fertilizer. And then it will automatically calculate your emissions based on your how much fertilizer you applied and how much nitrogen is in the fertilizer. Okay. Just one thing to be aware of here is that um, these calculations that are in the guidelines, there does need to be the application of of a conversion from nitrogen because you're calculating the amount of nitrogen it does need to be an application of a conversion from nitrogen ultimately um, to to um, nitrous oxide and then ultimately to carbon so there are some conversions which i'm not going to speak to now but ultimately they take place in this tool and the reality is that this tool is trying to get you to a carbon dioxide equivalent value um, and so they will convert all of the nitrous oxide emissions plus the methane emissions into carbon dioxide equivalent to be able to con report everything as a carbon dioxide equivalent value in the tool. Um, so just so that you're aware, that's what happens in the tool. And when you transfer it into SAGES, you report by the different greenhouse gas. So you'd report separately methane, separately nitrous oxide and separately CO2, but the tool itself although it contains these values, ultimately reports everything or to ton CO2E, ton CO2 equivalent, um, in order to give you a value in ton CO2 equivalent. Um, it reports or, or calculates everything converts it into ton CO2 equivalent by ultimately using what is called the global warming potential. I didn't touch on that earlier, I probably should have. A global warming potential basically tells you how much more potent a greenhouse gas is compared to carbon dioxide. So one ton of methane, for example, emitted in a fire would be equivalent to 23 tons of carbon dioxide. And so you would take the tons of methane multiplied by 23, and that would give you the tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Now the tool does that for you, so you don't need to worry about that. You just need to worry about making sure you put in the right inputs and you select the right values. Great, um, I know we are um, going to probably run quite short of time. So what I wanna do now is just briefly focus on harvested wood product in the next kind of 15 minutes, and then we will um, try and take questions at the end. So what we've done now is we've done the mass balance um, or the carbon ba mass balance around the plantation, where we've looked at losses and gains in the plantation itself. Um, but there's obviously this other aspect to um, greenhouse gas or carbon sequestration, um, and that is the harvested wood product. So when wood products are produced, like paper, wood, uh, um, uh, yeah, timber, when wood, wood, wood products are produced, they ultimately store carbon. So when you have a piece of furniture and that furniture is made out of wood, that wood has carbon stored inside it. And that is basically the carbon stored in harvested wood product. And so there's a second aspect to the calculation. Once you've calculated the carbon stored in the plantation, you want to calculate the carbon stored 
in the product that is produced. This becomes relevant then to the pulp and paper mills, as well as to the board plants, as well as to the sawmills, where their product that they then sell to sell to their customers contains carbon, and that carbon stays locked up in that product for a certain time period. And so what we're trying to do here is to quantify how much carbon is stored in the product um, and how long that carbon stays stored for, um, uh, or how much carbon stays stored in that product in order to be able to get a benefit or to be able to report to DEFI and also get a benefit under sequestration for the carbon that is stored in the product that doesn't get emitted to atmosphere, that doesn't contribute to uh, climate change, global warming. So here we're looking at the paper mill. Ultimately, we're looking at doing a carbon balance around the paper mill. And we would do the same for a sawmill and a board plant. We're looking at doing a carbon balance to understand, okay, how much carbon is coming in to the process or into the mill in terms of carbon in the timber, that's the raw material that comes into the mill, as well as how much carbon is leaving the mill. What we're ultimately looking for is we're looking for how much carbon is leaving the mill in the product. And so we want to subtract how much carbon is leaving the mill um, through effluent, so through liquid effluent, through solid waste, how much carbon gets lost through solid waste, and how much carbon gets emitted, because obviously some uh, mills will burn some biomass in order to um, generate energy for their process, steam for their process. And so there are uh, there is some carbon lost um, in terms of what is released uh, to the atmosphere. So we're looking at how much carbon comes in in the timber, how much of that carbon is lost as a result of effluent, uh, solid waste emissions, and then the difference is ultimately what leaves um, the mill in terms of carbon in the harvested wood product. And so the second part of the guideline focuses on quantifying the carbon um, from each of these different streams to be able to give you a view on how much carbon um, remains at the end of the mill. Um, there are calculations that are built into the tool as well as outlined in the guidelines. Um, these calculations look basically, like I said, okay, how much carbon is entering the mill? So this is the MCRM. Um, how much carbon is leaving as a result of emissions? So this is when you are burning the biomass to generate energy, for example, at the mill. How much carbon is leaving as a, in the solid waste and how much carbon is leaving in the liquid waste. And then what remains is the carbon that is in the product that leaves the mill. And this is the carbon that remains stored in the product and is not released into the atmosphere. Um, all of these are basically calculated values. Um, the reality is, though, that these values here in terms of the emissions um, to atmosphere, the solid waste, the carbon leaving in solid waste, the carbon leaving in liquid waste, there are default values that can be applied. So there are parameters in the tool that can be applied. So you can use default values or you can use values specific to your own mill or your own board plant, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, you will see that there are default values. We were talking about emissions. So you'll see carbon that's released as a result of emissions, carbon that's released in solid waste, carbon that's released in liquid waste. There are fractions here that can be used based on the different um, pulp or paper mill that is being considered here, the different uh, process that they are using um, in terms of digestion or processing of the pulp. Um, and, and you would then basically be able to apply the default to get these values to be able to subtract them from what is coming into the mill. Um, however, you can also use values that are applicable to your own process because uh, you may know how much carbon is lost as a result of burning the biomass. You may know how much carbon is lost in solid waste and liquid waste. So the question becomes if we can use defaults for all of these terms, or we know how much is, is in these based on our own uh, information from our own mills, how do we get how much carbon is entering um, the mill in the raw material, in the timber raw materials? And that is given by this calculation here, which again is built into the tool, and that's why it's important just to have a view of it. Um, it is basically a calculation where you look at the volume 
of timber that's coming into the mill. You then are multiplying it by default values. So this is the density of the, um, of the timber coming into the mill. Again, you can use defaults here. I'll show you the default parameters. And then you're multiplying by how much carbon is in that timber, how much carbon is in that biomass that is coming into the mill. You should already be familiar with this value or this default here based on what we did in the plantation section. But this is basically the carbon content of the biomass. So you're looking at how much biomass is coming in to the mill. And then you're multiplying it by how much carbon is in that biomass to get a view of how much carbon is coming into the mill in the timber. Um, in this case, yeah, you can also add, um, in order to understand how much is coming into the mill, you also add how much is coming into the mill in, in the form of recycled or in the form of um, timber coming into the mill from other processing facilities. Um, so you would also be able to add the, this here to do a complete carbon balance across your mill. So the intention is to do a complete carbon balance across the mill. Therefore, you want to account for all carbon coming in in your um, timber raw materials. However, at a later stage, you will be subtracting some of that because they can't be double counting. So let's say, for example, you purchase... Um, uh, you use recycled fiber, so you use um, paper uh, that has been collected from uh, the end consumer, and you put that into your process, uh, or you purchase in pulp from a third party and you put that into your process, um, the reality is that the carbon in that raw material, in that paper, um, could have been claimed by uh, the producer of the original producer of that paper or could have been claimed by the original producer of that pulp. And so they are already claiming for the carbon that is sequestered in the product that they are selling you and therefore including it at the end of the day results in double counting. Um, and so ultimately there are various rules around what you can include and what you must exclude and those are given in the guidelines um, but although you end up adding here to do a complete carbon mass balance across the mill, ultimately you'll end up subtracting um, certain inflows of carbon to ensure that there is no double counting. And so really we'll be looking at the carbon that enters in the form of timber from the plantation where there has been no one claiming the carbon that is sequestered in that plantation. Remember when we did the calculations for the plantation, we assumed all of the carbon was removed when we harvested it. So we basically removed harvesters, harvested um, wood from the calculation as a loss. And so now we have that coming into the mill and now we're trying to see, okay, how much is going to remain in that, in that timber or in how much carbon is gonna remain trapped uh, once the timber is processed in the product and can we claim that back again? So we're removing it from the plantation, but we're going to try and claim it here at least for what remains um, in the product itself and which is not released. And in other words, is sequestered in the product and remains in the product and does not contribute to, to climate change or global warming or our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, let's have a brief look at the tool. Um, so again, um, if we have a brief look at the tool, you'll be able to see that there is a tab called HWP. This is Harvested Wood Product. Um, and you will be able to, in this tool, see how you calculate um, what is coming in. So this first uh, table here is ultimately repeating what we had seen uh, here, where we are trying to calculate how much carbon is coming into the mill. Um, so here you would enter your volume uh, coming into the mill. Um, and so again, um, this would be um, this V term here, the volume coming into the mill. Um, let's see what values we're gonna put in 100,000. And then we're going to specify if that 100,000 includes the bark already or doesn't include the bark. Um, so you would have seen in this year that there is an adjustment um, if it's we want to report the over bark volume, if we're reporting the under bark volume, then they will adjust the under bark volume, making it higher um, in order to include the bark. So in this case, we are going to be saying it's over bark for now. 
the mean wood density, again, you would have seen that in this calculation as D. It's a default value from the parameters tab. The CF, um, again, here is CF. You would have seen that it's a default value from the parameters tab. And if we did report the underbark value, it would then basically adjust for a bark fraction. And this is also a default. So all the defaults here are in purple. They all come ultimately from this purple tab here. And you can go in and have a look and make sure that the right one is pulling for your specific process. Um, and this ultimately then will automatically calculate the carbon that is coming into the mill. Okay. Um, so that will give you this term here. And then if you scroll further down um, in terms of this tool, you'll be able to see it will give you um, the ability to enter the information to ultimately calculate how much is leaving in the form of emissions, how much is leaving in the form of solid waste, and how much is leaving in the form of liquid waste. Um, so although we quantify these, and we report them if we're over the threshold for the different categories. Again, these are removed from our sequestration calculation when we do the accounting. So there's a difference between, between um, reporting, where we report on everything to DEFI, versus what we account for under sequestration, which is slightly different. And this difference, again, appears in the calculation for the paper mills. Um, what we've done, what we do once we've now um, got this value, uh, let's go through here as a worked example. So let's just assume that these are all correct. So ultimately, we are going to come out in the end um, with what is coming out of the uh, mill once we've minus the solid and the liquid waste. So this is ultimately what's coming out of the mill. So this is ultimately the result of this calculation here, which is given in the tab or the tool once you have entered all the correct values. What we need to do now is say, okay, how much of this carbon is going to remain in the product? And so we've got the total carbon leaving the mill, um, but obviously different amounts of carbon are released over different times depending on the product. And this is where this term uh, that you see here uh, comes in. So when we look at trying to then convert it into how much is actually sequestered in the product, we need to take the exit of the mill, which is this, uh, this term we've just calculated, and then multiply it by this default value, which is the fraction of carbon that decays over the period of 96 years. These are default values we apply to be able to say, okay, how long, um, how, my, how long can we how much of the carbon can we basically claim is going to be sequestered or stay in our product? And this term here, this uh, fraction of carbon decayed that you see here, this FLC 96, these are default values that you will use. Again, they are programmed into the tool. You will be able to see the different default values depending on the different uh, product you are producing. So if you are a sawmill and you are producing, let's say, solid wood, then you have a different fraction to if you are producing box board. Um, and so you would apply this fraction or uh, basically the tool would apply this fraction based on your product and that will ultimately get you to your harvested wood product. Um, the same is true for sawmills. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this um, because I really want to leave just a few minutes for discussion or questions or input. Um, the same is true of the sawmills. So you gain, you would be looking at the inflows and the outflows. The only difference really um, with a sawmill is the calculation here um, is basically the same. So it looks at how much carbon is coming into the raw material. So you will remember this calculation here. We apply the same one for a sawmill. Um, the only difference here is that we have one value where we multiply how much is coming in by this default value to get how much is coming out. This default value has been determined and is in the tool. And this default value then takes into account all the losses that occur um, uh, in the process, in the sawmilling process, 
um, to ultimately give you how much comes out. So we're not now seeing separate values for uh, things like uh, liquid waste, solid waste, uh, emissions to atmosphere. We are now seeing a single default value, which takes into account all the losses and multiplies that into how much is coming on site and then ultimately gives you how much is leaving in your product. Again, you will see these values here. I've got them in the presentation. You'll be able to see these values here. They differ depending on what process you are doing. Um, so you'll see that ultimately, if you are doing, let's say, sawn wood in general, you would then take how much timber is coming onto your site and you would multiply it by 0 0.43 and that would be how much is leaving. In other words, you would be losing the other 57% uh, um, is assumed to be losses um, in the process compared to what ultimately comes out. So you can use these default values or like I said with the paper mills example, you can apply your own values if you have done a detailed carbon balance across your site, you can then apply your own values because these values may be too low or they may, may be too high. Um, so in other words, you may have more carbon coming out in your product um, because you have less losses, in which case you may want to argue to use your own value here. But if you don't have that kind of information, there are defaults provided to allow you to still be able to calculate the carbon that leaves your process in the product. Again, this is the carbon that leaves the process in the product. So you need to repeat the calculation where you multiply it by the carbon that uh, the fraction of carbon that decays or is assumed to decay over 96 years. This is a default value that you would then apply to um, the carbon that leaves the sawmill in order to get your harvested wood product. Um, just going back to the tool again so that you're aware, the harvested wood product for the paper mills and the sawmills is done in the same tab. So you would input the um, carbon entering the paper mills and the sawmills. So where we in inputted that uh, various information, we had the 100,000 tons, et cetera, I mean, 100,000 meters cubed rather. Um, that is where you'd input for both the paper mills and the sawmills. And then you will see here that there is uh, the further calculations in terms of the liquid waste and solid waste um, that is done separately. It's in the same tab, but you would use the pulp and paper mills if you were running a pulp and paper mill. Um, and then you would use the sawmills if you were running the sawmill. And so the sawmill calculation where you see this fraction that I spoke about here, this fraction of 0 0.43, for example, you would see this basically coming up um, under the sawmills one. So this is the fraction, and then um, this is ultimately how much is coming in, and then they multiply it by the fraction, and they would then give you how much is being is leaving the mill in your product, and then they would multiply it by the um, fraction of carbon that dec decays to be able to give you how much is sequestered. Um, what's great about sorry, the Jocelyn. It's, it's very difficult to see. Um, can you put it into presentation oh, mode? Um, sure, some let me put this into... So we've got some people saying um, you're showing oh. slides 42. Is that the correct slide that you're supposed to be showing? Because that's what we're seeing. Uh, uh, it should be, there should be one that says, let's try an example with FHWP on top. Uh, yes, but yeah, but just I am to... moving between all the others. Okay, we're not seeing it. Um... If you could yeah, just put it into presentation mode. Sorry, let me just uh, share again. Maybe is something that's happened. Are you happened. using the tool or on the presentation itself? I was going between the tool uh, and the presentation, okay. Okay, so we maybe that's the, the problem. Yeah, we weren't seeing the tool. Oh, I see. Oh, gosh. Okay. okay. <laughs> How long has that been for? <laughs> I'm not sure. I've just picked up the message now. So. Uh, okay. Uh, sorry, everyone. I didn't realize that. Um, I can't see the comments raised. So um, let's maybe, let me just try and reshare my screen. Uh, I think when you're sharing, it's only it. sharing your presentation and not your other screen. So it just depends on how you're working there. Okay, now it's not uh, sharing anything. So let me just try and see. Okay, it seems to have um, lost the ability to share. It's odd. Um, yeah, it seems to just completely not allow me to share now at all. 
as give me a second. Yeah, it's not allowing me to share at all. Oh okay, here we go. Can you see now? Uh, I'll put it in presentation mode. Can you see the presentation? No, nothing sharing. Just... Oh. See, so yes, it's shared on my side. Uh, hang on. No, there is definitely something wrong with the sharing now. Let me see. Uh, oh, you, were you looking at the tool? Was it on the tool or was it the actual Both website? of them. None of them seem to be able to share anymore. Okay, just have a look. On the webinar. Sorry, everyone, technical yeah. glitches. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe uh, well, um, Sam waits. I don't know where you last were able to see. Um, so um, was everyone, maybe you can just indicate with a thumbs up if you were able to see the calculations as they pertain to the paper mills and the sawmills or whether you would have missed that all in terms of the tool. Uh, John, let's just have a look here. John's got his hand up. Thanks, John. John, let me. John, you should be able to um, speak. If you just unmute. If you're talking about John Scotchard, I haven't got my hand up on my. Oh, side. okay. Was another John. <laughs> John, Sorry. what about you two guys in terms of the screen, though? <laughs> Let's see if I can share. I'm gonna just see if I can share from my side on the tool. Um, that's. Can you see that? Let me see if I, we can. Is that the tool you were working through? Jocelyn, I just don't I know can't see tab. anything at the moment. I don't know whether I need to try and rejoin, but I can't see you sharing Let's anything. See, Mary has got her hand up. Let's unshare here. Oh goodness me! Uh, let's give. We're doing Mary so well. Access. You were, uh, Mary. You can unmute and have a. You can, you can talk now. Mary, you just need to unmute yourself. You do have ability to use your mic now. Oh, thank you very much. There we go. Oh, thank you. I'm really enjoying the uh, presentation and I could follow everything. I could see the tool. Oh, good. I could see the shared screen and it was possibly only in the last maybe two minutes that okay. messages came into the chat box saying that they couldn't see anything. So but don't despair. You don't have to okay. go back for the last hour and a half. I was Thank like, we'll be, we'll be here for another four hours. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Mary. Yeah, it's, it's great. Thanks so much. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. It's not giving us. Um, okay. I think we were very much at the end. So um, let's not stress too much about it. Um, I think we've got only 10 minutes left. Um, we will circulate the presentation um, so that you can obviously follow it in your own time. I know it was a quick exercise to get through everything. Um, so we'll definitely circulate this so that you guys can work through it in your own time um, and work through it with the tool. And you're welcome to contact us if you do have any questions. Um, but re and the reality is that, uh, you know, if you're able to follow the slides in terms of the calculations, um, then, then if you put the right values um, into the tool, the tool does all the calculations for you. So it's about obviously um, making sure that you have the information that's specific to your plantation, um, but then the tool populates the, the really populates the defaults um, if you select the right species, the right uh, type of forest, et cetera, the right location. So provided you're selecting everything and working through the tool in that manner, Ultimately, the output um, will, will be calculated by the tool, um, but you can at least see what the tool is doing if you work through the PowerPoint at the same time to see what calculations the tool is performing for you uh, so that uh, you are familiar with how it's working. Um, so that's, that's in essence really an introduction to the tool. Hopefully you feel a bit more comfortable kind of delving into the tool now, at least the, having the slides with you as well as the tool, delving into the tool a little bit more playing around with it, seeing um, what you can do for quantifying the carbon sequestered in your own plantations and harvested wood products. Um, and yeah, like I said, obviously this is just initial. There are some complexities. There's loads of assumptions that are made, but this is really a, a very good starting point if you can kind of apply these equations and apply the tool um, that gives you a really good starting point. Obviously you can get uh, more detailed when you move towards tier three and you can get more accurate over time. Um, but really, this is the basics of greenhouse gas emissions accounting in terms of plantations and 
uh, and sequestration um, and harvested wood products. And so, um, yeah, if you felt relatively comfortable whilst I was talking, although I know it was at quite speed to get through everything, um, you should be all uh, you should all be then comfortable um, or all be ready to play around with the tool and to really get familiar with it. Um, but yeah, we will circulate the presentation. And if you do have any questions, um, because I know this was a really rushed quick session, I'm happy to engage um, on those questions um, as you apply the tool and as you play around with it yourselves. Um, I Thank guess you, maybe Josh. in the last 10 minutes, should we take any other questions, Sam? Just to yeah, end I've got off. a message from Julie around just showing the harvested wood products tool. I don't know if that's the one we tried to show. Um, uh, yes. it's... Uh, so I just showed at this stage the MRV tool with the harvested wood product calculations in the tab. Um, so I did try to show that, but now it seems not to let me share. Um, what I will do is, is just circulate to everyone to make sure that everyone on this webinar does have access to all of the right tools and the presentation and the information. It seems to have kicked me out completely out of sharing. Um, uh, uh, Hamish, uh, let me just get Hamish has got a question here. Let's just enable Hamish's mic. Okay, uh, Hamish, you can just unmute and you should have ability Perfect. to uh, Thanks, okay. Samantha. Uh, you can hear me, I take it? Perfect, yes. All right, just a quick question. So on a sawmill insight, uh, often we create chips. Um, so chips are then going off-site to another supplier. Uh, is that then still part of your uh, carbon off-site uh, calculation? Um, so ultimately, uh, I guess the question becomes what is happening to those chips at the end of the day and is are those chips being burnt? Um, so if they are being burnt, obviously that carbon is being released or if they're not being burnt but used to produce product by your customer, then is your customer claiming for the carbon that is contained in that product or not? Um, but if I guess in some uh, simplistically, if it's going off site, uh, and it's if it's going off site and it's a product, you can claim for the carbon that remains in it. The only problem with chips is, is if they are being burnt, then there's no carbon that remains in it. So you need to know what happens to those chips. It's your product that okay. you may be selling then to a third party, to a customer. If the customer is burning it, there's no carbon sequestered. So you can't you have to basically count it as a removal. If it's not being burned, you can count it as a product and you can then see what it's used for and claim that carbon in that products um, but obviously make sure your customers are doing the same yeah, so I was, no double I was uh, referring to products uh, specifically yeah. okay um, great but, but then, then yes it's your if, product if I, so if I claim it can hmm. the can my client also claim it or how, how do you prevent that double calculation there so in terms of the guidelines it should be you claiming it and so that's okay. why I said you know for example with the paper mills um, if, if they are purchasing in pulp or they're getting paper like recycled paper they have to exclude it at the end of the day because ultimately that's already been claimed by whoever produced that paper or produced that pulp mm -hmm. so because you are the producers of those chips you should be able to then claim for that harvested wood product so if your customer tries to, they shouldn't because ultimately it should rest with you. Um, but it is important, I think, just to make sure there's no double counting. But yes, you should be the ones who are able to claim it's your product and provided you know what happens to that product and that it's not being burnt. And so that carbon's not automatically being released if it's being then turned into something else like furniture or whatever the case may be, you should be able to then, uh, to then uh, claim for that carbon sequestered. Thanks, Justin. And they should so, deduct it. So, Justin, is that something then one would put on some sort of transactional documentation or if you're informing your supplier or your customer that you have claimed for the carbon or re reported on the carbon that's sequestered? Um, so I would, I would always uh, advocate for having it very clear so that there is no discrepancy between it. Um, so there are obviously... Um, uh, yeah, I, I, and, and I, don't, I would make that make that the case for for everything. So yes, I would want to agree at contractually, or want to at least make sure that whatever I'm claiming not is not being claimed by someone else, um, by my customer or by my supplier. Um, so that would be best practice. But ultimately, I guess in terms of the guideline, you are able to claim for the carbon in your product. Um, and I would then have to deduct um, it if I was your customer. 
and I was using your product, I would then have to deduct it from my carbon sequestration because you had already claimed it as the producer. Um, but it is, I guess, more gray than, than you know, I guess, I guess it is always better to agree contractually. So always better to make sure it's transparent and agreed contractually, especially when there are financial implications. Of course, thank you. So um, thank you everybody for um, attending this webinar and apologies for the technical glitches yeah. a, a little bit beyond our control. Um, so we have some upcoming webinars uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, next week we have one with uh, D Dr. David Everard and Dr. Steen, Stephen Germishazen. He They will be uh, covering the value-based platform BBP. Um, please, if you would uh, like to register, I have put links in the chat. And then we've got another one on the 10th of October looking at the SAGES tool. So, um, you know, we, we're obviously doing our best to educate you as best as possible around these uh, complex issues. And then, yes, just a uh, thanks to, to Jocelyn for your insight um, and the time that you've taken to give this presentation. I, I've got a few more messages come through saying that you it's a really good presentation and, and judging from what people have said, um, it, they are happy with what you've done. So thank you so much. We really appreciate it. As mentioned, Pleasure. we will have this um, recording up and uh, up on the uh, website on the PAMSA YouTube channel. If you would like a copy of the presentation and with uh, obviously with Jocelyn's permission, we can send out the relevant information um, just on a follow up email and then you can obviously reach out to Jocelyn directly if you have any queries. So thank you, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your Tuesday.